Bicycle frames are stiff truss structures with little vertical compliance. As we've seen in my recent video about frame comfort, the majority of the vertical deflection at the back of the bike is actually found at the rear tire, seat post and saddle. Today, we'll be diving into the world of seat posts and more specifically, suspension seat posts. Given that cyclists often have 60 to 70% of their body weight on their saddle, I don't know if there is any other component that offers as much of an improvement in ride comfort. That's assuming you've already optimized your tire width and pressure. The best bit is that a suspension seat post upgrade is as little as $100, and it's very easy to install yourself. Here are my six reasons to use a suspension seat post. Number one, you can improve your comfort. A suspension seat post both absorbs bigger hits as well as damping vibrations coming up from the road. The less strain your body experiences when you ride, the fresher you'll feel at the end of the day. Number two, you can stay seated for longer. Suspension seat posts allow you to pedal while seated on terrain that normally requires standing up. Compared to a rigid post on the same bumpy climb, I find that my legs often feel fresher with a suspension seat post, simply because I'm standing up less. Number three, you can reduce or alleviate lower back pain. It's not uncommon to hear people with back injuries say they couldn't ride a bike without a suspension seat post. By isolating vibrations and bigger hits from your body, you will put less strain on your lower back when you ride. Number four, they make narrow tire bikes much more capable. A suspension seat post allows you to take bikes with narrower tires on rougher terrain than you normally could. Obviously, this isn't an ideal situation, but you'd be surprised how off-road you can go on 38 mm tires. Number five, the performance is not height or weight dependent. The comfort of a regular seat post is dependent on your body weight, as well as the amount of exposed seat posts sticking out of your frame. As smaller riders often have less body weight and less exposed seat post, they have the most to gain with a suspension seat post upgrade. And number six, they are lighter, cheaper, and more simple than a full suspension bike. Rather than using a full suspension bike, you can fit a suspension seat post to a hardtail and enjoy similar levels of comfort without the extra weight, price and complexity. Here are four reasons not to use a suspension seat post. Number one, the weight. You can expect a 100 to 500 gram weight penalty over a conventional aluminium seat post. Number two, the suspension bob. When you pedal, your body movements create forces that can activate the suspension. This bob will occur to varying degrees depending on the seat post model and setup. Number three, you have a full suspension bike. If your bike has rear suspension, your saddle is already suspended, so you do not need a suspension seat post. And number four, you have a fat bike. If you're riding a bike with four to five inch wide tires, those tires are likely deflecting 30 to 60 millimeters over bumps which means that the benefits of a suspension seat post are significantly reduced. With the pros and cons out of the way, let's closer examine the role of suspension seat posts. There are two things they're looking to achieve. A larger amount of vertical deflection, which takes the edge off bigger hits, and a higher level of damping, which increases vibration absorption. Deflection is the total movement that a seat post will move after an impact. A seat post with more deflection will reduce the fatigue on your body as it protects you from harder jolts like unexpected potholes or dirt road corrugations. It'll also allow you to keep pedaling through particularly bumpy terrain. Damping is the speed at which the seat post will move over repeated bumps. A seat post that dampens vibrations effectively will help to insulate you from road bars coming up through your bike. High exposure to vibrations can actually increase the risk of various injuries, including lower back pain and spinal degeneration. This is why vibration exposure is often regulated in industries that require driving or operating heavy machinery. When we measure seat post vibrations in a laboratory setting, we find that some seat posts can absorb 15 times more vibration than others. For example, the Thompson Elite seat post was tested by Microback Laboratories to absorb just 0.025 Gs of vibrations, while the Ergon CF3 was absorbing 0.375 Gs. But interestingly, data recently collected by the University of Exeter suggests that once a seat post is installed on your bike, it may not reduce vibration exposure. That said, this test was conducted using rigid carbon and aluminium seat posts, so it'd be interesting to find out whether suspension seat posts are more effective using the same test protocol. Let's now take a closer look at the different damping systems of suspension seat posts. 
First, we have spring damping. The best way I can describe these seat posts is that they're very springy. This makes them exceptional on off-road terrain as they're super responsive to bumps. But there is a cost to this high reactivity. I've found that when spring posts are perfectly set up for rough terrain, they bob more than I'd like on smooth surfaces. The easiest way to reduce this movement is to adjust the spring preload, or amount of force required to cause the saddle to start moving. This will stop the saddle bob, but will also reduce the seat post's ability to take the edge off small bumps. If smooth roads are your thing, you'll likely find spring seat posts a bit too active. This brings me to elastomers. Elastomers are the quiet achievers as they're much less noticeable underneath you. This is the result of elastomers having an inherently slower rebound speed after an impact, which is particularly beneficial while riding on fast, bumpy surfaces like gravel roads. I tend to prefer the more muted feel of an elastomer post. It feels more natural, for lack of a better word. The downside to elastomers is that they can firm up in cold conditions, rendering them less effective. So skip this design if you need it to work well in sub-zero conditions. I've also found they require lubrication around the edges of the elastomer, although this maintenance is essentially solved with a simple seat post cover. Lastly, we have air damping, which is sometimes used in telescopic seat posts. The main advantage is that you can adjust the spring rate to a higher degree of accuracy. Now, let's look at the two different suspension seat post designs. Linkage-driven suspension seat posts move in the same direction as the forces coming up from the rear wheel. This allows them to very effectively counteract and even neutralize bumps, reducing the impact forces traveling through your back and bum. In addition, linkage posts ensure that the saddle to pedal distance is mostly maintained when the seat post is compressed. A telescopic post is usually considered inferior as the angle it compresses is different to the direction of force coming from the rear wheel, resulting in a less reactive seat post system. Telescopic posts also end up with a shorter saddle to pedal distance when you are riding over bumps. Despite their flaws, telescopic posts are still very common as they're often lighter, cheaper, more subtle, and have a lower installation height. Let's move on to the data to see how these different seat post designs compare. Christoph over at Gravel Bikes has been using his smartphone with a vibration meter app to compare the vibration absorption of different bike components on both a rough trail and a fast gravel road. On the rough trail, the spring seat posts are, by a large margin, the most effective at mitigating vibrations. Meanwhile, the Elastoma Cane Creek E-Silk offers around half as much vibration improvement. However, it's worth noting that this seat post only has around half the suspension travel. It'd be interesting to see how a longer travel Elastoma seat post compares here. And finally, the air seat post improved things a bit, but clearly requires a higher bump force to activate. The gravel road with fast, repetitive bumps narrows the difference between an elastomer seat post and a spring seat post, despite the variation in suspension travel. This is because the bump force is lower on gravel roads, which means that the spring post is likely only using half its travel anyway. The air seat post showed little difference from the typical carbon seat post in this test. Suspension seat posts are available with anything from 20 to 90 millimeters of travel. So, how do you choose the best travel for you? Rougher roads warrant more suspension travel. As we just saw in the test, if you're riding on rougher terrain with larger forces coming from the rear wheel, you will benefit from more suspension travel as it can dampen more vibrations. I'd say most rough roads can be comfortably cycled with just 35 millimeters of travel but 50 millimeters or more may be required if you're hitting bumps at higher speeds. More upright riding positions are also better suited to longer suspension travel. This is simply due to the higher percentage of weight on your saddle. Conversely, if you have more weight on your hands because you ride in a more sporty position, you can get away with less suspension travel. Finally, let's now take a look at the best suspension seat post products. The Connect 2.1 and 3.1 are among the most active seat posts on this list, offering 35 millimeters of travel. There are five spring rates to choose from, suiting riders right up to 145 kilograms. The Carbon model is the lightest coil sprung seat post money can buy at 471 grams. These seat posts are particularly active in their initial part of their travel, so they tend to be better suited on rougher trails rather than smoother roads in my experience. That said, you can quickly firm things up without using any tools via the preload control knob, which is an optional extra for $16.
The Redshift Shock Stop is the best coil sprung post I've tested, as it seems to do a great job of absorbing off-road bumps without bobbing too much on the smoother roads. However, it still isn't perfect. When I got the preload right for off-road terrain, I found there was more bob than I'd like on the road. Unfortunately, the preload bolt is not particularly accessible, as it's at the bottom of the seat post, so it's not an adjustment that you'd want to make too regularly. The shock stop weighs 547 grams and can be used by riders up to 110 kilograms. The Byshul's G2 is a very highly rated seat post. There is a short travel version with 30 millimeters and a long travel version with 50 millimeters of suspension. You can choose from five different spring rates, which will suit riders all the way up to 150 kilograms. There are 10 different diameters too, making them suitable for almost every bike. The downside to this seat post is that there is no preload adjuster, so you might find it feeling springy sometimes, and it's heavier than most at 700 grams or so. The low cost suspension post of choice is the Suntour NCX. At under $100, it's a complete bargain, but there are downsides. It's pretty heavy, around 800 grams, and it comes with only one spring rate out of the box, although softer and firmer springs are only $15. The maximum rider weight is 120 kilograms. I've spent years on the previous version of the Cane Creek Thudbuster. With its slower rebound speed, I think it's a great option if you ride a larger percentage on smoother surfaces. The 50 millimeters of travel is ample for off-road use too. There are four spring rates to choose from, suiting riders right up to 150 kilograms. If you ride a mix of gravel and tarmac roads, I don't know if you can do any better than the Cane Creek E-Silk. At half the weight and half the travel of most squishy posts, it performs closer to the best carbon seat posts available. But the key difference to a carbon post is that the spring rate isn't determined by how much exposed seat post you have, allowing you to perfectly tune it to your body weight using the five different elastomers available. Regular dropper posts have very little vertical flex, which is an unfortunate consequence of their telescoping design. If you love dropper posts, but also want to maximize your ride comfort, there are two suspension options available and a third in the works. The best performing model is the Byshul's D2. It costs a small fortune, but this coil sprung option will stay incredibly active on bumpy roads. Like the regular Byshul's post, there are multiple spring rates to choose from and 30 millimeters of travel. The other dropper option is the PNW Coast, which has 40 millimeters of suspension and is the best value dropper by far. This air sprung system has been tested by gravel bikes to be much less active than the other suspension seat posts, but it'll still take the edge off those bigger hits and performs well on gravel roads too. In summary, a suspension seat post is a great comfort upgrade as it will both absorb bigger hits as well as dampen vibrations coming up from the road. This essentially means you'll feel fresher at the end of a long ride. For anything slow and off-road, you cannot beat a spring damp seat post. These posts are incredibly active underneath you and will allow you to stay seated on rough surfaces for much longer. If you ride a decent percentage on smoother surfaces or are sensitive to suspension bob, you'll prefer elastomer seat posts as they're less noticeable underneath you. The Cane Creek E-Silk is what I personally use and recommend. It's great for if you have a sporty ride position like me, or if you mostly ride on smoother roads. Given it only has 20 millimeters of travel, you will have to compromise on the rougher roads, but I still find it offers a significant comfort improvement over a regular post. Plus, it doesn't bounce, it's light, and it's elegant. If this video has inspired you to pick up a suspension seat post, check out the affiliate links below, which will help to support this channel. You can also support my bike nerd content directly on Patreon or via PayPal. Alternatively, grab a copy of my touring or bikepacking buyer's guides, which will teach you everything you need to know about the bikes before allowing you to compare hundreds of current bikes at the back of the book.